Authorities say a U.S. Army reservist fatally shot 18 people and wounded 13 others in Lewiston, Maine on October 25th. The suspected shooter, 40-year-old Robert Card, was found dead by an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound two days after the shooting. I'm Stephanie Haney, and in this edition of In the News Now, we're sharing more about the victims of the mass shooting, looking into what happened and how the community continues to grieve for the lives lost. The suspected shooter in the main mass shooting stayed one step ahead of police after killing 18 people and wounding 13 others at a bowling alley and then a bar. Dispatchers received the first 911 call on October 25th, just before 7 p.m. from a bowling alley where Card first started shooting. Four officers at a shooting range nearby heard the call and arrived within 90 seconds. The card was already gone. Then at 7.08 p.m., dispatchers began receiving calls about a shooter at a bar about four miles away. The first police arrived there five minutes later, but card was again nowhere to be found. This led to a two day search that closed businesses and had residents sheltered in their homes. Card's body was discovered Friday, not far from the scene of the shootings. Matthew Torres has more on how the hunt for the shooter came to an end. Tonight, new details on how a massive manhunt for 40 year old Robert Card came to an end. Maine State Police finding his body inside a box truck at the Maine Recycling Corporation in Lisbon early Friday night. Law enforcement had checked and cleared the main property twice before. We cleared trailers that are there on that business footprint. Nobody had any idea that across the street, across Capitol Avenue, there's an overflow parking lot. Public safety officials say the owner was diligent, urging police to search the overflow parking lot, especially since he had worked there before. Police found Card, who appeared to have shot himself inside one of about 60 trailers in the overflow property, and two guns at the scene. One picture that I saw looked like he had the same sweatshirt on that he had the, the, the picture that we put out at the bowling alley. The public safety commissioner suggests Card may have walked a trail along the river from where he abandoned his car by boat launch Wednesday night. I expect them to, them to find him in the river. David Druin lives near Robert Card's family. He describes the past few days as crippling after authorities say Card shot and killed 18 people at a restaurant and bar and bowling alley. One victim as young as 14 years old. The motive remains unclear. It's unnerving, but today just feels it's like this big weight off your shoulders. While communities are feeling relieved the search is over, it's not enough to ease the pain families are going through. Kids are going to grow up without a dad. You know, it's horrible. I mean, this is going to go on for years and years and years. They'll, they'll never forget it. A former Maine Recycle Corporation manager says he told the FBI about the overflow lot location where Card's body was found. Jack Mulmud spoke with him about the discovery. You, that you would run this trail, right? Yes. Chris Poole says he worked at Maine Recycle Corporation for 12 years, ending his time there during the pandemic. I was a driver manager, amongst other things, listening to, you know, the pandemonium in one area and then the next area. and. Um, just trying to wrap our heads around exactly what was going on. Watching the news with his family. At about 5 o'clock, I got a call from CNN. Questions about his employment at Maine Recycle. After reports that alleged gunman Robert Card had ties to the same workplace. So after hearing the reports that Robert Card had ties to the Maine Recycling Corporation, Chris, who also used to work at the Recycling Corporation, realized that he used to jog on the same trails that connect you from the Miller Park boat ramp all the way to Maine Recycling Corp. We first learned about the Miller Park boat launch after police said the shooter left his Subaru there as the manhunt began Wednesday night. When he made the connection, Chris Poole says he called the FBI. I showed them the map, um, described to them that, you know, perhaps he could get into one of those trailers. Some of them are locked, some of them are unlocked. Um, also suggested that, you know, if he was looking to hide, you know, if people were coming, that he could simply bury himself in, in some of the recyclables that were inside the trailer. Showing us the same route he showed investigators. And four hours That's after he says he spoke to the FBI, they found Robert Card's body with a self-inflicted gunshot wound in a trailer at the Maine Recycle Corp overflow lot. And according to the FBI, they wouldn't confirm if Chris Poole was the one who tipped them off. They only said they got hundreds of tips. The first response is a sigh of relief. But for Chris Poole, just offering up what he knew felt important to do. You know, if you know something, say something. As he and the community continue to process this nightmare. Sometimes that we think, you know, Mainers don't experience things that the rest of the world experiences, but, um, you know, but we do. In Lisbon, Jack Molmud, News Maine.
The 18 people killed in the mass shooting in Maine included a 14 year old bowler, a shipbuilder who loved playing cornhole, a sign language interpreter, and so many more. According to Maine State Police, seven people died at the just in time bowling alley, and eight more people died at Schmanji's Bar and Grill. Three others died after being taken to hospitals. The victims were remembered Sunday evening during a standing room only vigil at the Lewiston Basilica. The name of each victim was read aloud with a bell tolling between them. Trisha Asselin. William Brackett. Peyton Brewer Ross. Thomas Conrad. Michael Delorier II. Max Hathaway. Brian McFarlane. Keith McNear. Ronald G. Morin. Joshua Seal. Arthur Strout. Bob Violet. Lucille Violet. Steve Vazella. Jason Walker. Joseph Walker. Aaron Young. Bill Young. Please join me in prayer. God of many names, we take the time to lift up all of the people affected by these horrific events and those of us who will now be affected forever. Walk with us in our grief as we share words and signs and silence. We hold the families of those whose lives were cut short last week. The youngest victim in the shooting was just 14 years old and his father was also killed. Bill and Aaron Young were out for a night of bowling. It was something they did most Wednesday nights. Hannah Cumler sat down with Bill's father and Aaron's grandfather, who in the midst of so much pain shared memories of his son and grandson. Bob Young is holding on to the memories of his son and grandson. We spent a lot of time together, yeah. From his home in central Maine, Bob says his son Bill and grandson Aaron had an amazing bond. As a father and son that, that loved each other and you know, did, did their things. Aaron was passionate about bowling and would get in practice rounds on Wednesdays with his coach, Bob Violet, another victim of the mass shooting. I see he, he loved Aaron because Aaron, very detail minded. If you told him to do something, that's exactly what he did. A rule follower. A rule follower, absolutely a rule follower. A boy with a huge heart and a quiet demeanor, Aaron was recently awarded a citizenship award for his kindness and compassion. And, you know, very gentle, you know, didn't have a bad word for anybody. Especially not his father, who Bob says he idolized. Bill served in the U.S. Air Force, just like his dad, Bob, and went on to work as a mechanic. And he loved his job, you know, he loved professional wrestling. When he was a little kid, we used to go to wrestling matches and stuff. And One thing the three of them shared, a love for fishing. Getting out on the water to fish with his boys 
was one of Bob's favorite things to do. Yeah, miss it already. <laughs> but on the shores of a lake where he's cast hundreds of lines with his son and his grandson, there's always the reminder that even in the depths of this heartache, the memories will always surface here. Oh, love you both. You know, I miss you. Another victim of the mass shooting was beloved American Sign Language interpreter Josh Seals. He was playing in a cornhole tournament for deaf athletes when he was killed. Vivian Lee has more on Seals' life and the tributes pouring in for him. Tributes are pouring in for Josh Seal, a beloved American Sign Language interpreter who was the voice and face of Maine's deaf community during the pandemic. We pray for those who were injured. Because of those abilities, so Josh had been tapped for distance interpreting for Vice President Kamala Harris over the past two years. Well, yesterday morning for VP Harris, uh, because we just uh, weren't available. So, and, and of course, her team completely understood. Noel Sullivan is the CEO of Pine Tree Society, where Josh served as the Director of Interpreting Services. He led a team that provided interpreting for deaf and hard of hearing Mainers throughout the state, from funerals to medical appointments. Sullivan says Josh had a passion for making a difference for his community. And Josh did not lead with, um, I, I, I want to be a good manager. He led with, I want to be good for the deaf community. So. His wife Elizabeth Seal posted to Facebook that her husband and father to their four children was a fantastic father. Quote, he loved his family and always put them first. This is what he will be always remembered for. Josh is also leaving behind a legacy to help break the isolation for deaf students at an early age. Two years ago, he helped found Camp Dirigo. The week-long experience held at Pine Tree Camp in Rome brings together deaf youngsters from across the state, where they learn to communicate and trust each other through various activities. A vision he explained to New Center, Maine, just this past August. This opportunity to spend time with, play with, learn sign language from each other is such an amazing experience. Sullivan says Josh's efforts to make life better for deaf kids will live on, not only in the summer, but possibly in the winter too, teaching kids to ice fish, providing life-changing experiences and friendships they can turn to for the rest of their lives. In Scarborough, Vivian Lee, New Center, Maine. Tricia Asselin was a part-time employee at the bowling alley who had worked there since it opened. She was there on her day off Wednesday to bowl with her sister when she was fatally shot. Ann Baldridge spoke with her mother, who says she wants to make sure Trisha is remembered as a great person, a great mother, and a great sister. Trisha was dedicated to helping society and people. She even walked the Boston Marathon after that bombing. She knew you can't run away from terror, it surrounds you. Trisha's mother, Alicia Lachance says their family grew up in West Bowdoin, Maine. Little did we know that the family down the road that got on the bus every morning would be the family of the guy who shot her. Her mother said she worked at Just In Time Recreation Bowling Alley since the day it opened. Although on Wednesday night she wasn't working, she was just there bowling with her sister. Trisha was trying to get to the phone to call 911 when she was shot. I was watching Celebrity Wheel of Fortune down here in Florida and it broke into the, it broke into breaking news out of Maine. People shot at a bowling alley and they showed the bowling alley and I know that bowling alley and I watched them build that bowling alley. Trisha worked there from the day it opened. I called her phone immediately and I knew, oh God, I knew. I'm sorry. I knew I had to call her sister's phone and there was no answer either. And I said, oh no. I started praying, praying, God, please. I called every hospital from Maine to Massachusetts, everywhere. I says, check the operating room, check the, you know, the emergency room, please, please. I didn't know, but I knew in my heart it was true. And it's about what I can say right now without collapsing, Carol. It's horrible. Trisha leaves behind her son, her three siblings, and her mother. The family says she will be buried in Auburn at the same place her father is buried. I want everybody to remember she was a great person, a great mother, 
a great sister, the best friend you'll ever have. Trisha's mother says please don't set up any GoFundMe pages in her name to avoid scammers. When the time comes to create one, it will be through the family. In Lewiston and Baldridge, New Center, Maine. Businesses that have been closed during the hunt for the shooter are now back open in Lewiston, Maine. John Croman checked in with the people who run a popular breakfast spot in the area as the community comes together during this time of grief. Good morning, how are you? The quaint cafe known as Franz. Oh, so you want the window seat sure. or that one there? It's open for breakfast for the first time in three days. And when he was found and we just, yeah, we, we had to open, you know. For manager Linda Tucker, it was a small step towards something resembling normal. It's hard just to be home and not be able to do anything, not know who's okay, who's not okay, you know. Well, this is the best breakfast turnout we've had in a bit. Mark Maylot felt it was important to get together with his old friends and decompress. For, for a few days, a small town becomes the focus of a nation and it's the worst possible reason for a town to be brought to light. No one's going to forget the name Lewiston, Maine. Today's headline was news that broke the night before. And we literally just like, you could almost see our bodies like, oh my gosh, it's over, like it's done. What's done for Lanaya Spearman's family, the hours of not knowing what's next. It was like a thunderstorm without the thunder. We were waiting for something to happen and we just kept waiting and kept waiting and everyone was living in fear. It appears to be a mental health nexus to this scenario. Same for William Edwards, who we spotted in Fran's parking lot watching the latest news conference on his phone. I've been watching my phone for the last three days, uh, not able to get off it, wondering what's going on. Across the city, signs of hope and a determination to pull together for the families hit the hardest. It's nice to be a part, like, within the community again and like knowing that other people are around and just taking the time out of their day to spend time with their loved ones and their family. You need to push through this event because it's not a normal thing. It's not going to happen every time and we all just have to be cautious of our surroundings but we still have to live our lives too. I just think the more we come together, we let the fear go, we hold each other's hands. It'll be, we'll get there. In summary, the people we met here today are glad to be around other people again and relieved that the immediate danger has passed while acknowledging that the road back from this community's trauma will be a long one. In Lewiston, John Croman, New Center, Maine. As the community begins the healing process, many are now looking into the state's gun laws. In Maine, there is a yellow flag law which requires police to get a medical practitioner to evaluate a person and find them to be a threat before police can petition a judge to get a person's firearms taken away. Now that law is under scrutiny following updates about the shooter. Authorities say he'd been committed to a mental health facility for two weeks this past summer and reported hearing voices and threats to shoot up a military base. Zach Merchant dug into the law and how it apparently failed. In a big state that can feel like a small neighborhood, a shooting's impact touches so many. Back in April, there was another shooting where the guy ditched his car right next to our house in Yarmouth, and we moved here, and uh, it happened again. And in a place where everybody seems to know their neighbor, many now wonder why wasn't Robert Card stopped before he opened fire? Same as you, waiting to hear more details on that. Maine's yellow flag law is designed to give police the power to take guns out of the hands of people who could be a danger to themselves or others. And in Card's case, there were clear warning signs. The mental health aspect of this, there's a piece of that, uh, where there's paranoia, uh, there's some conspiracy theorists. State uh, Public Safety Commissioner scared. Michael Sostruck said the evidence suggests Card may have been hearing voices. And a statewide alert was sent to law enforcement last month after Card reportedly made threats against the U.S. Army Reserve base where he trained, according to the Associated Press. If, in fact, um, the suspect was hospitalized for two weeks for mental illness, that should have triggered uh, the yellow flag law and he should have been separated from his weapons. It's not clear whether anyone had used the yellow flag law in this tragic scenario, but gun control advocates have blamed these latest killings on what they call Maine's, quote, weak gun laws, end quote. 
Now the community is focusing on grieving and trying to heal amid the tragedy. Thank you for being with us for this edition of In the News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney.